We're gonna do a, a grass dance next time. This is my son Aiden, and my son Jordan's going to pull his uh, rope on right now. When it was explained to me when I was growing up, grass dancing, when um, they went to go out and um, have a celebration or a ceremony or a, a powwow, they always sent the grass dancers out first. And um, you'll watch their movements that it, it reflects the, the wave of the grass. And when the grass dancers would go out, they would um, leave a mat for our, our ceremony. Um, the tall grass, they could actually leave it into a mat with their feet. And after we did our ceremony and everybody left and we parted ways, the grass would stand back up and you would never know that we were there. While they're dancing down the grass for us, they're also praying to help uh, purify the dance ground and stuff like that. You'll, you'll, uh, there's actually a lot of different versions and stories of grass dancing, so. The one I'm, I'm telling you is just a quick version that I've explained to my sons. There's another version of um, the grass dancer being the scout, also the first one out. So you'll, you'll notice grass dancers back then, not now so much, used to, used to be the first ones out for battle or for ceremony or you name it. They got the uh, honor. And now it's become a stylized contest dance. So different people will have their own styles. Some people have a slower, graceful style, and some people have a more energetic style. I've always grown up being kind of an energetic dancer, so my boys are more energetic dancers too.
he's like putting on his um, his robes, getting ready to go. He wanted me to take a little um, intermission to introduce myself and keep you guys entertained for a second. And I'm all sweating up here. People. <laughs> A little intimidating, but hey, I'm here. So, um, did you guys have a safe to travel here? I hope you did. All right, so here he is, and then his, his boy. So Wes said, uh, he came up and approached our group, he said, you guys want to come for Don Trudeau? And I said, who? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a huge honor. Uh, I thank you. Thank you very much. Of course. You're my brother. I think that's another aspect of Native people. Humor. Without humor, I don't know where we'd be now. Two versions of it. Um, it's called a duck and dive. And what a, what a duck and dive is. When they were, um, everybody knows Chief Joseph. The cavalry was trying to get up into Canada. We've all heard the story, right? More relatives walking in the door. Uh, that's where this song and this dance comes from. There's there's a a distinct heartbeat that you'll hear in this song, and when that heartbeat comes, it's really awesome if you see a full floor of. Uh, men's traditional dancers. When that heartbeat comes, it represents the cannon fire that when the cavalry shot at those guys trying to get away, that's what that heartbeat represents, is cannon fire. And so that's kind of where the duck part of the, the duck and dive comes from. Man. And when you see a full floor of men's traditional dancers all do it together, man, it's pretty awesome to watch. I usually don't get to watch it. It took me years before I ever even got to see it because I'm always dancing. And when I got to see it, I was like, man, that is awesome. This is awesome. So that's where this song comes from. Um, well, the one we're going to do is the, the Montana Duck and Dive, it's called. There's different versions of it. They actually, the song themselves are, are really close. Unless you're uh, a singer, you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't notice the difference. The main difference in the Montana Duck and Dive and... The, the one that comes out of Washington is uh, they don't put the heartbeats in the first part of the one from up north. And the Montana Duck and Dive, they put them in both. You'll notice that we, when we sing our songs, we uh, do verses, and then halfway in between, there's that little pause. So that uh, in the first half of the Montana version, they do the duck. And that's basically the difference. And then there's a... Uh, a little bit of the vocal board has changed that just a little bit.
called a sneak up. And the sneak up dance comes from sneaking up. Uh, it's, a, it's a story. A dancer will tell a story of either a hunting trip or uh, a battle that he's reenacting or uh, a camp that he snuck into and taken something new. <laughs> Like a breath. <laughs> so, uh, at the beginning part of the song, a lot of times they'll find their sign, a footprint or some hair or, or, or something. And you'll see them look for that. And then they'll find their, their trail and they'll follow the trail until they lose it. And they'll, they'll do this three times until they get the get on the trail good and, and now instead of doing the ruffle at the, the fourth verse it, it'll all be like a straight song which is like a victory I got it I found it I got my that's what that, that last one is so I think we'll do a short version <laughs>
custom in our way when uh, eagle feathers are on the floor that we rise. So we don't usually ask people in presentation or just like that to arrive because it's a presentation. So thank you to those people.
All right, so I lied. We didn't actually do any word songs yet. They just reminded me. <laughs> so we'll do a word song.
Thank you. I think you just about said it all there, Wesley, so I guess. <laughs> Stole the show. Stole the show, yeah. <laughs> okay, Ni Pachwai, Mishna Misha. I said good evening and how are you? I hope everybody's in a good way today. Um, it's an honor to be here today, and it's an honor to see everybody here, to listen, and to see the life that we that I grew up with as a little as a baby and as uh, growing up to uh, Salilo. Like Wesley said, Salilo Falls was a trade place of the Northwest. They used to call it the the Niagara Falls of the Northwest. It was, you know, our fishing place, our way of life. Uh, it was a gathering of place for different tribes to come and trade, you know, buffalo. Uh, people came from the south to trade. People come from all over to... We never had money. We just bartered. We traded. You know, we traded salmon or whatever we had to survive by. And <clears throat> today, Salilo is still there, but no falls. We still have the longhouse. We still have our way of life. We still have our salmon feast that we have in, in April. And we still have our, our big power we have in Halloween. Um, but when we have our salmon feast, it's one of the biggest ones that we have. And we have tribes that come all over from we had people come from as far as Turkey, from uh, a lot, well, from Alaska, and we had people coming all the way from New Mexico and Mexico and you know, Florida, just to trade and participate in our ceremony. So it might be a little hard for me because it, it's, you know, I still remember it when I was six years old. Um, I remember the thundering sound of the falls, the mist in my face, the smell of salmon swimming over the falls, and seeing rainbows echo as I echoed through my vision, or was it just all a dream? As a young native girl, I remember my great-grandfather telling me in the YM language, I will never give up my salmon and let my people starve as long as I am chief. These falls are what the Creator has given to us to eat and live for generations to come. But it never happened. I remember Tilla, which means grandfather, drink some of the water out of his hand from the river. That's how clean it was. And that's why it's so sacred to us. That's why, you know, we. We just, you know, we crave for that water. It's our life. It's our, it's what heals us. Grandfather smiled with his wrinkles of wisdom, how proud he stood overlooking Salilo. And he would sing a song of gratitude to the Creator. How proud my grandfather chief was of his people, Salilo Wayam. How proud he was of having enough salmon to feed the people of the village. The Northwest tribes, <clears throat> the visitors from other countries, and enough food for the winter. So Lila YM was a way of life, a gathering of friendship, laughter, to enjoy what the Creator had provided for our survival. Salila was also a trading place for all that needed salmon 
sacred fishing grounds and gathering place for all the tribes and a place of traditional spiritual and cultural events. <clears throat> Every time I went back home to Salilo, my heart would pound faster and anxious to see the falls, to feel the mist in my face, to smell the salmon cooking, and to hear the echo of the falling water. But when I reached Salilo, my heart would break. I felt sadness, loneliness, and the emptiness of silence. The river so calm, not even birds flying above waiting for the salmon to jump. No mist, no echo, no smell of salmon. Missing the wisdom of the elders, the songs and prayers of the drums, listening to the laughter of the cooks and other natives, children playing, and salmon cooking on the sticks. Since the inundation of Salilo Falls on March 10th, 1957, my grandmother, she didn't want me to see the, the flooding of the falls, so she put me in Christie School. It's a Catholic school in Lake Oswego. And that's where she put me so I wouldn't have to, you know, cry for the falls, feel, feel sad for the falls, because it was hard enough for her taking care of my great-grandfather, Chief Tommy Thompson. Because he felt that he knew this was not going to be our falls anymore. So he, he was getting sick. So Grandma had to take, take care of him and put me someplace where I would be properly taken care of, which was a Catholic school. Minded me of boarding school, too. <clears throat> Since the inundation of Salilo Falls, some of the YMs had moved to the reservations after receiving monies for the dam. We are still salmon people, and even though we had lost our native language, our traditions, our livelihood, and our way of life, my grandma Flora said, there is no more falls, grandfather. slowly died of a broken heart. When we had the 50th commemoration of the inundations of Salila Falls, it was a gathering of old friends, elders wandering, old pictures of the falls, remembering the salmon cooking on sticks, teaching the future generation of the way of life we had, how to prepare and sit serve our four sacred foods to the people. Our four sacred foods are the salmon and the deer meat, the roots and the huckleberries. Like John said, we drink water, we, we honor the water. It's sacred to our people. It don't matter what tribe it is, it is sacred. So for us, we drink water before we eat and we drink water after we eat, giving thanks to the Creator for providing the four sacred f foods for us to feast on, and we eat in silence, enjoying the food. During the commemoration, I felt a resilience of healing, a communication between the natives and the non-natives, feelings of happy thoughts, the sadness of the elders, the tears of joys, the tears of sorrow, empty nets, but the nourishment and satisfaction of hungry people. <clears throat> and an understanding of losing a great memory that the Creator had given us. A livelihood and a way of life that never will be. Memories to live by, pictures that tell the history of a people who died when they buried the falls. My uncle said it was one of the biggest funerals he will never forget. Neither will I, but my heart will always be at Salilo and my roots are there. Salilo Falls, the echo in a falling water, no more. This is what I wrote um, when they had an essay about what Salilo Falls means to me. I was surprised I got second place for it. <laughs> this was for college. I'm a 
I'm a junior at Portland State University. Um, right now I'm doing Native Studies and I did a presentation about Salilo because a lot of students were interested in knowing what, what it was about. And so I told my story, I showed my video, and now we have uh, the Northwest Indian History at Portland State. And so thanks to Dallas and the Cultural Center, Cultural Heritage Center in Warm Springs, I will be teaching the issues skiing at Portland State in September. <clears throat> But uh, right now, um, it, it's surprising how things have happened. We still have our salmon feast, and we still honor the, our four sacred foods. And um, it would be nice to see you people at our salmon feast in, in April to come and enjoy what we have and what we provide for you. And. Um, I would like to show this video from two gentlemen named uh, Ian McCluskey and Steve Martell. They they had found this picture of Salilo and they wanted they were history they wanted to know the history of it, so they did this uh, documentation about Salilo, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. enjoyed it and this is something that we still live for and we still pray for it but you know like I said memories are hard to forget and um, I have pictures up here and I'm reordering uh, my books called Linda's Indian Home and I'm trying to get the one revised come to our salmon feast but it's all about growing as I, when I was a baby at Salilo and Come to Our Salmon Feast talks more about my grandfather and how we do things in the longhouse and about how our young men went to war. So, but if you want to come up and look, I'd be honored to have you come up and see them. And um, am I supposed to do, huh? Is there anybody with questions? I don't want to do that. <laughs> No questions? Good. <laughs> oh, <darn it. laughs> yes. When is your ceremony in April? Uh, the first, uh, usually the first weekend in April, uh, usually around April 10th, 11th, or 12th, or that weekend. Yes? What does Salila mean? It's Salila YM. It was, uh, it means salmon people. Um, well, when they flooded Salilo, they assimilated all the people to the different tribes, uh, the Yakima, Umatilla, Warm Springs, and Nespers. So, but we're still, I guess we have some, someone trying to have Salilo, YM, as a, as a tribe, but I think we already are a tribe. Any more questions? <laughs> so I'm just waiting for Wesley. But if uh, you want to take, uh, I'll be taking orders for books. I'll probably have them probably in a couple months. So you're, you're up, Wesley. <laughs> Thank you. I want to thank uh, John and Brandy and the guys from Signal Butte who started off tonight. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> and of course, Lamouche and uh, the information that she has shared with you about 
about the clash of cultures in a way and what happens when some people aren't very respectful of other people. So I hope you took that to heart. And because the Elwha Dam came down, um, we can have faith that other dams along the Columbia River can come down too. I want to give a special thanks also to Matt and Wesley and Colette from Associated Students of Lane Community College and NASA. Big round of applause for the hard work they did. And uh, you might know him as the Peltier figure, Jimmy Looks Twice in Thunderheart, or Randy Pion of K Rez Radio in Smoke Signals. Yeah, many of you do know him from that. Or Coyote goofing around with Iktomi in Dreamkeeper. Or Louis Shorthair in Pow Wow Highway. He's a movie star. You might also know him as the front man with a group of amazing musicians called Bad Dog. His newest record is Crazier Than Hell, and it's really good. Um, I hope that we have some here. I know that there are lots of records here, lots of CDs. I've got a bunch of them up here, and I think they're going to be some for sale later on. Um, over the last 25 years, he's put out several albums. In 1986, Bob Dylan called the album, a.k.a. Graffiti Man, the best album of 1986. John did that with Jesse Ed Davis. He's a rock poet. Maybe for you, he's been a teacher as he has for me for a long time. He's a teacher, yay teachers. <laughs> but perhaps John is best known for his commitment to justice and to truth, expressed through various forms of activism over the years. With AIM in the 70s, with friends like Jackson Brown and Bonnie Raitt in many, many events to support environmental and social causes, and tirelessly on the road talking about Ovarian cancer, health care for women and children, sanity and drug laws and energy policies, honoring of the human being in each one of us, and all the other issues that I imagine most of us here in this room take to heart. However you know John, there's always more to him, and however you know the world, there's always more to it. Always deeper to go. Some people take us deeper, inspiring us to not just skim the surface, but to seek what's real and what matters. So pay attention. Whatever else you hear tonight, you'll get a chance to hear what's real and what matters. He might tell you he's crazy, and maybe that's what it takes to really figure out what's real and what matters. But here to show us what he sees and inspire us to open our own eyes, Mr. John Trudell. Let's just stick it up there. No, I'll hang Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm gonna start off by I'm really glad that you're here. And I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere. So <laughs> kind of how that goes. Uh, and I am crazy, <laughs> right? I don't just say it, <laughs> I live it. Uh, and I smoke pot. <laughs> so, so, if I, so if I say anything you don't agree with, I'm crazy and I smoke pot, all right? <laughs> I'm not trying to start anything. You know? <laughs> well, you never know, you know? <laughs> Uh, and I'll be as coherent as I can for as long as I can. And I'm not exactly sure where we're going, but we're coming back. <laughs> All right? I'm going to start by reading some poems, and then we'll see. This is called Moments Are Shapes. And then life is a decision we make. And moments are the shapes those decisions take. And evolution is a way of wandering through time. Somewhere between birth, some place before death, something from the past, today brings for tomorrow. 
wander dizzy or wander alert and wonder about what could be some leftovers from the next last go-round. And when the merry-go-round isn't feeling that merry, time to remind the tears a smile is just a smile away. Laughter brings us memories waiting for us to happen in realities of catching up to where we've already been. Through the good and the bad and the way flux fluxes, and nothing's been done that hasn't been done before. So the redoing is about redoing the same but different. And the ride is a hell of a ride if that's the ticket we buy. Insane ideas of pain is more acceptable than pleasure. And ideas of guilt by birth are what makes it acceptable. Turning light that's supposed to be light into a burdening. Walls and dead ends and windows behind locked minds. While in a conspiracy of reality, the moon and the stars join with the sun in a sending of more light for replenish. Every day brings more chances to ride the ride different. Every breath we take can be fresh breath in many ways. And in the choices between depressings and blessings, what we decide is what we create is our show to star in. I call this one a lot of a lot. Got no time for wishing and regretting. He already passed any good that'll do. And waiting for better's times is too slow, and time needs to move on as anxious. Time on his hands or time on his mind is a lot of a lot more time than he wants. He already tried using time to escape, or maybe it's time uses him to escape. Anyway, it all ends up the same or not. Days are still days here to get through before the nights get to take their turn, a way time has of passing him around. So if he wasn't doing time, time did him in some kind of alchemy of overs over, changing light into dark, then into spark, like a clean slate to start all over again. Chances to paint some prettier pictures when he's not out of it and spilling paint, times his mind is like a shaking thought, thinkings and sounds of rattling rainbows, and not really sure is the only sure thing. Times starts making sense never started, or stopped making sense never stopped. In between is the time to fill in the blanks, some things to do with the time of his life. And, uh, yeah, I, I want to kind of address the issue of who we are, you know, because yeah, in my crazy, see, sometimes I think I'm in a dimensional reality where we don't know who we are anymore. We don't understand the languages, the sounds we make. We don't understand what that's all about. We no longer really understand our purpose. So I think it all comes back to an identity crisis. We just we don't remember who we are. We're human beings. That's who we are. That's our primary identity, human beings. Human and being. Two, human being. Sometimes you say, I'm only human, but that's just not, <laughs> not right. We're human being. Human being. Our connection to the to reality, our relationship to power in reality is in that identity of a human being. Human part, our bone, flesh, and blood, our DNA is made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. We're shapes of the earth. We have being. Being is spirit, energy, being. And our being comes from our relationship to the sun, sky, universe, our being. All things of the earth are made up of the same DNA, the same metals, minerals, and liquids. All things of the earth have the same relationship to the sun, sky, universe. All things of the earth have being. Being. So it's the being part is where our power comes from. The being part is the energy that runs the human. 
the being part. We are human beings. Our real relationship to the reality of power is in that identity of being a human being. We're living in a technological perceptual reality where we know that they can take the DNA of the earth that's called uranium out of the earth and put it through a mining refinement process and convert its being into a form of energy that they call power. We know they can take the fossils out of the earth and convert, convert its being into a form of energy. We don't understand how they do it, but we know that it can be done. Well, the purpose of technologic industrial civilization, the mining also mines the being part of human through how the human is imprinted to perceive reality when the human is born or enters into this dimensional reality. The being part of human is mined through the intelligence and how the human being is imprinted to perceive reality. And this is turned into an energy that runs this larger system. Now we, we know that when they take the being part of the uranium or the fossils and put it through this mining refinement process, it leaves behind poison and toxic waste, threatening to the life environment. And when they mine the being part of human, it leaves behind poison and toxic, threatening to the life environment and the poisons and toxics that are left behind when they mine the being part of human through the intelligence of the human. These are the fears, doubts, and insecurities that become a part of how the human perceives self and reality. I'm not into this to be the best human being. I just want to be good enough not to be bad. I don't remember seeing many or any heroes, but I saw some people who did heroic things. Anywhere else left to play is in its own duality while breakers of masks hunt the mask fixers. And the relentless of virtuals, of virals, virtual technologic, stalking prey in new created hunting grounds. And fragmented thoughts come tumbling down, like a torrential rain's weepings of jagged tears, drowning out the sun like a dark enemy of light with the odor of fear mongers replacing serene. On the edge of it's all we can do to hold our own, Tempters and tempted splashing their promises. Know how desperate gets when desperate gets. It's easy enough to keep the confused confused. So doing time in a maze of deliberately broken appears to be a riddler's riddles needing solving. And I'm nothing more than another puzzled part looking for the right place to fit without crying. Over then over again as a song playing my head, wearing memories to fill in some forgotten story about how there's no one doing that do unto others, a life between the last breath and the next breath, the one that decides to elude the predator or not. Then there's that scenery where glory and shame keep cutting in with their Joneses wanting to Jones, like drunken dancers trying to outdrink their fear out on stage where the house controls the music. So then me and Creator worked out our own deal about finding the entrance in the best ways I can in realms where there are no exits, only entrances, and the color pouring from our eyes is our vitality, how our spirit shows us how we're living or dying. <coughs> Is there any water? <laughs> Where? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> so everything is about energy. The being part of human is our energy. Everything is about energy. Everything that ever goes on in this dimensional reality is about energy. That's good, thank you. Now energy, our intelligence, our creative intelligence, our creative thought, 
is generating energy. It's an energy generating. Without, when we think, we generate energy. When we think, we project electromagnetic energy out into a vibratory reality. We, when our brain thinks, these are electrical circuits that go on. Energy, everything is about energy. Now the power of our intelligence, the power of the energy of our intelligence. You ever had the situation where you felt powerless? And while you're feeling powerless, how bad can you make yourself feel with your fears, your doubts, and your insecurities, your self-judgments? How bad can you make yourself feel? And how does this affect the people that you interact with? That's power. That's the energy of your creative intelligence. Now, you, the energy of your creative intelligence used chaotically and incoherently. Now imagine that the power of that creative intelligence used with clarity and coherency. It would generate the same way when we're, when we're in a bad thing and we affect the people around us, we're generating this energy, that intelligence can be used with clarity and coherency and generate a different type of energy that is felt. So this is where power is at. And anyway, so thinking, when we think, we project electromagnetic energy, and energy is supposed to move. It's, it's, it's supposed to move. It's, it's meant to move. It will not be denied. It's just how the movement can take place. But it's really supposed to flow. So to understand the value of our intelligence, we're supposed to use it to think. To think. Thinking represents the flow. But a part of the imprinting process of the mining of the being part of human is we are imprinted to believe we are not taught to think. We are imprinted from birth to believe we are not taught to think. Now thinking represents energy flowing. To believe, the imprint of believing represents energy taken and put into the container that is called believing. Because all beliefs have their biases, prejudices, limits, doubts. So it's, a rep so it's like taking the energy of thinking and putting it in this container, and now it has no place to go. It's, all, it's like it shuts down the thinking process, dams it up. And then when, when, the, when the thinking process is dammed up by these, these boxes and cages of belief, the energy has to do something. So what it does is it just intensifies internally inside this cage and then it leaks out through the stresses that are, are the self-doubts and the fears, which then distort how we perceive reality and it distorts our perception and how we participate in reality. And the important part, of, one of the important things about this to remember is every fear, self-doubt, and self-judgment that we have, we didn't think it up. Somebody put it there. And somebody repeatedly said it until we believed it repeatedly. And our perception of self got, got altered. And then we start to participate in this dimensional reality from the perception of our inabilities rather than the recognition of who we are with our abilities. The power of our intelligence. We talk about wanting alternative energy. We need to recognize, it's time to recognize as human beings, we are the alternative, we are the ultimate art, alternative energy resource. We are it. So our power doesn't come from political systems, or economic systems, or religious systems, or nationalistic systems. Our power does not come from these things. Our power, we are born with it. Our power comes from us. When we enter into this reality, this is where our power comes from, the being part of human. So we are a part, so we, but we have entered into a technologic, industrial perceptional reality where all energy is mind. I find it interesting we call this the mind. <laughs> they just spell it different so we don't catch on, you know, in my own opinion.
Because whatever it is that we're, we're confronted with in our life individually, collectively, generationally, whatever it is that we're confronted with, we need to trust ourselves enough to use the power of our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we can, all right, to create clear and coherent solutions. To create clear and coherent solutions. See, it, it, one of the things that concerns me, see, so much of what's going on now is, is reactionary fear-based. People are reacting out of fear. So the, out of fear. So everybody's reacting out of fear. And this brings, an, this brings reactionary energy activity out of programmed, imprinted beliefs, this reaction of fear. So any solution that's created is going to have fear in it because that's the way people are going after it. I look at environment, as an example, I look at the environment, you know, and I don't, no, no offense to anybody, but I think that the environmentalists were doing this because they truly cared about the earth and truly cared about life, it was about caring, right, versus being afraid. It would change the dynamic of the energy. It would make it stronger because it would bring that caring into the solution. But if it's fear-based reactionaryism, then it's going to bring fear into the solution. The other thing I don't... I think we really need to look at and have a, a good understanding about because if, if we, we like to talk about spirituality and the holy holies and things, you know, and I think how can I show respect to my creator if I don't respect my intelligence? See, because I, it affects how I communicate with the creator. If I don't respect my intelligence, if I say I love the creator and I respect all the spiritual reality of the creator, then why can't I respect myself? Why won't I respect myself? There's a basic contradiction there that gets in the way of us creating these coherent solutions. See, we have no reason not to respect ourselves. We were imprinted by those who wanted to feed off of us fear-based fear. People living in a fear-based dimensional reality that didn't read, they had it programmed and imprinted into them, passed it on and imprinted it into us that there's something wrong with us. So we have to make a little understanding here. Whatever it is we say is our spiritual identity, then if we're going to be true to our spiritual identity, then reality is it's time to understand there's nothing wrong with us and accept that. Otherwise, we're not being true to our spiritual identity. And not to confuse, we've all done wrong things. I know we have because we've been born into this reality and you can't get through it without doing them, but don't confuse doing a wrong thing with there being something wrong with you. Because the only way we're gonna truly get through this individual life, collective life, generational life is we need to bring some clarity back clear energy. And every one of us has the ability to do that. Every one of us has the ability to do it, but we have a convenience of a bad guy to blame. See, and with the convenience of a bad guy to blame, see, then we don't necessarily really have to take responsibility, all right, for our own power and our own energy because we got the convenience of a bad guy to blame. See, we need to think some of this stuff through. Because I come out of the 60s, you know, and we threw all we had into all our idealism and our righteousness, you know. But you know what? <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work, did it? I said it did. Well, yeah, but it didn't because we're dealing with a more dangerous beast than we've ever been. It's more dangerous now than it was when we started out in the 60s. This is basic reality. This is just basic reality. This is no condemnation, no nothing. We got to look at reality. We got, you know, it's like part of our responsibility with our intelligence. We have the, the, the ability and the responsibility to recognize reality, not to judge it. Because like thinking and believing, if we're going to recognize, then we can see. But if we're going to judge, then we can't see any more than what the judgments allow us to see. And the, end, and the things that happened through the last 40 years, 50 years now, however long it is, we gave it our best shot. But we didn't think outside the box. We didn't think outside the programming. 
We tried to save the democracy. We tried to believe in the voting system. We tried to do all of these kinds of things. We didn't think outside the box. We confused rebellion and resistance. We, we confused it, all right? <laughs> we blew it into something it wasn't really. Because any gains made by the civil rights, all the gains that we made during the 60s and 70s are being taken away now. This is why I say it didn't work. It bought some time. But the predator class, that industrial ruling class, that, that was their intention, was to buy time until they could consolidate it and put it together. And we fell into it. And this isn't, you know, this is just the reality of what happened. So something, I call this carrying those rattlings. Nights and days looking for a way with lives turning on dreams and loves. Then dreams and loves can turn on you, but until then, it's more something to do. And then there's something to knowing just when to take serious, serious, and then when to leave well enough alone, and in between, don't beat yourself up. As laughter smiled at the thoughts of ways how crazier everything can get at the times when some more crazier really is more crazier than we needed, Doing the right things at the wrong time, doing the wrong things at the right time, bring ways of confusing to themselves. Right gets wary and wrong doesn't care. Maybe we could have done it all different. And again, maybe, maybe once it this way, the reasons for doing what we keep doing are part of us needing to recognize reason. When there's no all goods, there's no all bad with guilt, sin, and blame rattling their chain, making noisy, crowded sounds in our head, blinding us to our abilities and ways to see past rattling chains and what they're all about. All things we can do, all things we do can be lessons we learn or can be mistakes we repeat and repeat, depending on how loud and on how close and the why we're carrying those rattlings. Should be worth remembering those chains aren't our chains. Someone put them on us, wrapped them in our mind until we believed. After all's been said and after all's been told, how we think can make the rattlings go away. Something I want to put in here, see, is like to think about. So I'm not trying to get agreement or disagreement, right? <laughs> not my trip, right? And uh, <laughs> just to think, right? That's all. Because that's the missing link. See, that's what we didn't really do in the 60s and the 70s. We emotionally reacted the way we, we, we emotionally reacted to our beliefs. So we did take the time to think because we've been imprinted to believe that believing is thinking and it's not. That's how they tricked us. Imprinted us to believe believing is thinking, but it's not. My I'm to use, we did everything inside the box. We believe that civil disobedience was non-cooperation. We believe that civil disobedience, if it was violent or non-violent, with permission or without permission, we believed all of that was non-cooperation. But I'm telling you now, it wasn't non-cooperation. We were cooperating with an energy-consuming system that's designed to absorb all energy directed in its way. Does this make sense? So whether our demonstrations are peaceful, we buy magic markers, we buy the little bottles of water, we get all the stuff right, we feed into the economy, their economy. If it's nonviolent, I mean, if, if, it's, if it's not per, per, uh, permitted and we go against it, just do it as an outright act of civil disobedience in another degree, we still buy the bottles of water, all right? We buy a mask, right? And the police get to beat everybody up. And then everybody gets to take seats, so in everything, in every situation, we fed our energy to them because we weren't thinking. We were emotionally reacting, all right, to our sense of outrage or whatever it was. We were emotionally reacting. So I want us to think about non-cooperation, about non-cooperation. See, to just civil disobedience and just to do that thing, it has the appearance of non-cooperation, but in the long run, when you're in an energy, and a, a machine designed to absorb all energy directed at it, then it's cooperation. So non-cooperation. Some examples of non-cooperation. 
You want to not cooperate? Then like yourself. <laughs> you want to not cooperate? Then stop believing the lies, the fearful lies that they imprinted into your consciousness to, as a way to see yourself. You want to not cooperate? Truly understand what humil to be humble is versus to be proud. You want to not cooperate? All right, be accept, be a human being and think like a human being. You want to not cooperate? Then think. Don't allow your emotional buttons to be pushed. You want to not cooperate? This is on an individual level. On a collective level, as just a hypothetical hypothetical example, if all of the energy that had been put into the Occupy movement. All of the energy, energy represented by time, money, movement, everything. If all of the energy that had been put into that movement, I think if that energy had been put into a non-cooperative act, a non-cooperative act of, say, organizing everybody in this country, 30% of the population did not spend any money on the same day. See, that would have been a statement that they had to listen to. They could not ignore it. Because you're not cooperating. So things of non-cooperation need to be thought out. Because this, you know, I, because I looked at what happened, and I'm not gonna get into pros and cons about the Occupy thing, but what I do know about the Occupy thing, all right, is that that 1% is getting to play war games, that 1% is getting to identify the people that will give up, that are emotionally attached enough right now to go out there and make their identities known. They're tracking the money, they're tracking the IDs, they're tracking everything. So this is a great learning experience for them, but for the Occupy movement, it's, it's really been no more than an emotional outlet. See, so we need to think. We need to think about what it is that we do. I'm not saying we should or should not occupy. What I'm saying is there should be some clear, coherent reason, reasoning and understanding to why we're doing what we're doing, rather than just an emotional reaction. Anybody, anybody in this dimensional reality wants to control you, all they got to do is push your emotional buttons. And every time their name or their image comes up, you're not going to think clearly. Whether it's individual relationship or whether it's a human being against the state. So it's time for us to take responsibility for how we use our intelligence. And to think in our own terms of what, what it means to not cooperate. You know, I mean, after all these years of this stuff, that wherever I've been in this reality, I've come to the thing here, see, I'm not going to fight the bad guys. I'm done fighting the bad guys. I am. All right? I think it's better to help the good guys than it is to fight the bad guys. All right, and because it's perceptually how we enter it, how we use our energy. All right, helping the good guys. If we're going to use our energy to fight the bad guys, well, the bad guys may control by their ability to fight. <laughs> they absorb the energy. They push the emotional buttons. See, so, so philosophically speaking, we need to think. I'm not, whether you agree or not, I'm just saying to think about, all right, there are many, the dimensions and ways of being able to help the good guys that need, in ways that need to be done. We need to be creative. We need to trust ourselves, our own create, creative abilities. Because, and, and, and we all have creative ability because if we can create our own misery because of our fears and our doubts, right? Then we have creative ability. Every morning when we wake up, we create, because of the way we're imprinted to perceive reality, we create our own reality for that day. So if it's a completely overwhelmingly miserable reality, it's because we're creating it because we've been imprinted to create it that way. Remember that we're human beings. Part of this mining refinement process is that the identity of the human being has been, the whole purpose, I think, of technologic industrial civilization is to suppress the memory of the human being and then replace the memory of the human being with a new identity. And that new identity is automatically a victim identity. If you're a female, it's a victim identity. If you're a male, it's a victim identity. Whatever your race, it's a victim identity. Whatever your culture, it's a victim identity. So we no longer function from the identity of a human being. We don't. But all it takes is to remember, <laughs> to understand the value of our intelligence. 
it takes is to remember. You know, instead of saying I believe, let's say I think. Because when we say I think, we're activating the thinking process. When we say I believe, we're deactivating the thinking process. This is an act of non-cooperation. Truly it is. And remember, every negative thing that we believe about ourselves, somebody put it there. It was when he woke up in the middle of a dream, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a life, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of time. Everything started to get more interesting then. The many ways some people carry their hurting. Lifetime spent getting used, trying to dull pain. Accumulating distractions almost like addictions. Shooting up self-blames and fears like habituals. In a using of a phrase like high octane uncut junk. Fast falling psychological lows into familiar's rush. Becoming our own dealers, we open our closets. Get to our private stashes for our trip for the day. Hallucinations of there's something wrong with us, imprinted from birth, that pain is a part of God's love, and God loves us even though we're guilty of sin and our mistakes make us the bad or the inferior. With pleasure is the sin, so pain is the way to go. Because of the because we will always be guilty, we deserve to be punished because they say so, using emotional smack with chaos as a sedation. Distorted reflections of ourselves into black holes, painting us in dark thoughts and negative images into cages of believers of we are damaged goods, therefore suffering is our main rightful entitlement. And the farther we follow them, the more we feel more lost as they lead us away from the identity, the reality of our spirit into the abyss they say leads to heaven and gold, but away from the pleasure of appreciation of life or the pleasure of seeing each day as opportunity and the pleasure of free thinking or the pleasure of feeling good about oneself or the pleasures of learning from our mistakes or the pleasures in recognizing ourselves and the power of our creative or the pleasure of pleasure as blessings that heal. I'm a pleasure advocate. <laughs> I just don't get God's, the whole, the whole concept, God loves you, so therefore he's going to just hurt you. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Some of this stuff they tell us is an obvious sign we're not thinking clearly because we listen to that stuff. <laughs> think about it. Uh. Been praying for some protection from the madnesses of sane men. Considering the borders of insane, sounds like sane is further insane. Like versions of in, intensified sane with madness as part of the normal. Cold-blooded against warm-blooded, armed with civilized rationalizations. Competitive edges used like swords, inhumanly cutting through humanity. Using smiles as lies, fronting hollows, sounds of what's in our best interest. Then they turn excuses into reasons to put on their scariest violent mask. Fear serves them like chattel slave, chains in the minds rattling invisible. Emotionals don't know what to feel, leaving feelings feeling abandoned. In a pervasive of spreading wounds, scarring imaginations with isolations of not good enough hidden behind, Pride's uncompleted needs to devour. Feeding the madnesses of sane men is like the frenzy of their cannibalism is hidden by their definitions of sanity. Profit before people, industrial wealth, 2% own 70% or something like that. They make the rules that say it's right with the lie of all spare and love and war. As they radioactive the future's child in a detachment of ancestor realities, disconnects from the past and future, a spirit lost to homicidal self-loathing, running rampant in the subconscious, feeding the madnesses of sane men. Tricked out gods. As soon as he got here, he heard a voice telling him, welcome to these psychedelic madnesses, madness hallucinations of tricked out gods. 
And the deal is in learning to ride their ride without turning into their ride or their ridden. Whatever bad they're up to, they're good at it. This is a mining system, almost like alchemy, using psychologics as a way of separating inside intelligence, manipulating perceptions, harnessing energies of being in human form, deep imprinting the scent of reptilian as fear until the scent of reptilian becomes a familiar, generating energy and the power of desperate to feed their technologic diseased sanities, altering vibrational frequencies into illusionary, replacing thought patterns with belief systems, implanted replicating human, rep, implanted replicating reptilian images of reality, knowing reality is defined through perceptions. Then as soon as he got here, he heard a voice telling him, this isn't about a need to be afraid. This is really about recognizing where he's at and his many abilities to fine tune his senses. He entered well protected if he allows himself to recognize reality and the power of who he is, with clear thinking to be used as an antibiotic, seeing through illusion as an instinctive talent. Active when in sync with intuition and feeling, and when inherently self knows to trust itself, liking itself enough to never turn against it, is caring's ancient primal balance ingredient. This isn't about beginnings and about endings, it's about entering and leaving dimensionals as travelers in the illusions of tricked out gods use power of intelligence as a medicine shield. <coughs> you know, being just is. <coughs> so sometimes I think, so <laughs> no, I know, we, we come from the dimension of being, and then we take human form and we go back to the dimension of being. So it's all a trip, <laughs> right? Okay. So I think anyway, we, <laughs> there's this place in, in the red dimension of being, and the earth is, with the earth is like Disneyland, <laughs> right? It's like an amusement park. <laughs> and, and we come here, see, this is the ride I'm taking. <laughs> right? And you all got your own ride. <laughs> so the trip is to get through the ride without freaking out. <laughs> anyway, it's a theory I have. <laughs> and, I'm not picking this ride again. <laughs> just, just so you don't know, I'm going to say it right now. Uh, oh no, wander over here for a second before I space it off. We, we would like, if you remember, HempsteadProjectHeart.com. HempsteadProjectHeart.com. And HEART stands for Hemp Energy Alternative Resource Technologies. All right? And I'm working with some people, we call ourselves the Olders. All right? uh, well, because we're old, but but, and, but we also recognize the reality. See, elders, they have it all together, you know? I mean, the elders. <laughs> but we need wiggle room yet. <laughs> so, so we call ourselves the olders, so <laughs> that way you just got to deal with it, right? You know? Okay, anyway, that, that's what that's all about. Right? And we're trying to look at youngers, all right? Because our idea about it is, well, olders, you know, a long time ago, the olders had it. People, the youngers listened to the olders. It was at least because the olders had experience. Maybe they hadn't solved it and found that pedestal stuff yet, but they had enough experience where, you know, it, it could be passed on. And what we're looking at now is our, what I call this helping the good guys thing. We want to see how much, our objective is to see how much consciousness, energy, we can raise around the identity of industrial hemp as industrial hemp, as an alternative energy resource for this planet. This is what our objective is. Everybody knows about medical marijuana and pot, all right? And I, but I think it's time that we put a look at here, industrial hemp. Because, you know, in the medical marijuana and in the mar whole marijuana movement, everybody talks about marijuana being medicine for the people, medicine. When I got, and, and I understand that. 
See, but I think we need to think beyond people now and to the planet because industrial hemp is earth medicine. It's medicine for the plant. It can be, it doesn't need pesticides to grow. It'll do what oil will do. It'll do what the trees will do. It'll do what the, the plastic, plastics will do. It'll, it'll feed you, it'll clothe you, it'll shelter you, and it'll provide fuel, all right, for industrial needs. It doesn't need toxics, it doesn't need poisons. It creates on a yearly basis, it creates, it creates oxygen for a sky that's filling with carbon dioxide. It would save the farmer, it would create industry and jobs, it would reduce our dependency on the petrochemical toxic reality. So what we're looking for is we're looking to see how many people will consider this and try to and do what they can to make, put their energy in a clear, coherent manner into raising this awareness. So this is what we're after, <laughs> all right? I, before I space that off, I want to put that out there. You know, and we've got to, we're developing a whole program, well, I don't know if it's a program, but, but a way to go after this, because, all right, to raise this consciousness. and. and uh, but anyway, we'll be showing up soon, <laughs> all right? But we want people to think about it. And I know in Oregon, there's this thing about get the referendum. See, I personally don't think enough emphasis is placed on hemp. I think more, I think too much emphasis is placed on the pot part rather than the hemp part. But I'm gonna say this to the people that are medical marijuana people. See, you keep running into the obstacle of getting it approved to getting the voters, to getting it voted in. And I'm saying you have a natural ally in the industrial hemp, in the farmers. There's a whole, whole body and group of, there's a whole energy field out there of people, all right, that would support hemp because it would support them. See, and I think it's a matter of communicating this and raising this awareness, and then I think these other things can be accomplished. But anyway, we're looking at the industrial hemp thing because, you know, because I, it's about hemp. Hemp was the largest cultivated plant crop on this planet up through the mid 1800s. And then, you know, they discovered oil. And then by the 19, after the 1900s, they had oil, they had figured out how to make plastics out of the oil. Randolph Hearst owned trees and he wanted to make newspapers. He owned forests and wanted to make newspapers. But prior to that time, the first grow law in America was a hemp grow law. But the first grow law in America was they had to grow hemp. All right? This is back when they were colonies here. Hemp was used to pay taxes. It was used as barter. It was used up through the 1800s. Hemp. Hemp, it was mandatory to grow hemp. Hemp was a great part of the industry, for lack of a better term, for the in agricultural industry in this country, all over the world. But then in the 1800s, they discovered oil. And the difference between, see, hemp and oil, was see, oil, only a few people could own it. Only a few people had the means to produce it, whereas hemp, Anybody could grow it. It was a direct threat economically to where the petrochemical industrial society wanted to head. But it was acceptable and people used, grew the hemp. So then when they went after pot, marijuana, reefer madness, went after all of this, they used racism, the Mexicans, and marijuana. But it was never about that. It was always about the hemp. It was always about the hemp. They went after the marijuana, all right, and the Mexicans, because America was a racist country, right, and the marijuana, they could use fear tactic people with that, right? But it was the hemp they were after. But they couldn't say they were after the hemp because too many people had an economic interest in the hemp. Too many farmers were growing. You see, it was still providing a segment of the economy for people. So they said, they, they shifted to all of the attention to marijuana, pop. But they were always, it was always about the hemp. Why do you think that they fight the legalization of it now? It's not about the pot, it's about the hemp. This is basic reality because the pot, yes, yeah, so well, a bunch of potheads or people that are sick want to go off and get high and smoke pot, that's no big threat to them. But if you have millions of acres of cultivation by farmers under industrial hemp, that's a threat. 
So we want people to think about this. To do a good thing for the earth, let's get the hemp. Seriously. I'm not saying put down our other issues and our other stuff, but do this one for the earth. We went after the medical marijuana for us. Do this one for the earth. You know, and you don't have, you know, because I mean, it was, you don't have to use toxics, pesticides, or anything on the hemp. It makes stronger, con hempcrete makes stronger concrete than concrete makes. You know, it can, so anyway, I wanted to put that out there before I space it off because. <laughs> well, uh, and at some point, we'll be showing up in Oregon with some shows around this too, because we're, we're really going to go after this. And, what, what, uh, and actually, I can say, but I'm work, working with Willie Nelson on this. He's a uh, <laughs> this is a bus plan. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this one is called Wild Seed. Ancestral living, memory outlines, tracing. Today and to, to many parts of the always bends, the seeds of life, chances to reseed again. Some wild seed. Wild seed is what we need. Global warming's climate change accelerate, and a world feels like it's running out of breath. The land is feeling the heat it can't get used to, and the, and the sky keeps needing room to breathe. Burning bridges in throwing cautions to the wind, middled in waiting for a hard rain is going to fall. Don't know what to do, doesn't know what to do. After believe, believed its way into some things. Now it doesn't know how to believe its way out. The human beings turned into the human race. Then the human race raced faster than it could. The progressive race in an aggressive hurrying, life into discardings, used ups and destroyeds. Then comes a time for things to start looking up. In the gray, black and whites, it's time to color. Planting the earth and wild seed greens and hues, time for those deepening roots holding together. The future through the past, and earth to the sky, somewhere in the balance and energy of reality, watching our step, when we step, where we step, is a way of seeing what we're doing as we do it. Living the wearing out of lives in over our heads, sow what we reap before we reap what we sow, could be better off's way of making things better. Today is as good a day as any for remembering the earth and the people and how to live together and wild seed to help heal the spirit, heal the land, planting seed into crops of plant energy as basics for fuel, food, shelter, clothing, and cleaner's oxygen. So whatever it is that we're faced with individually, collectively, or whatever, <coughs> we can think our way through it, but we can't believe our way through it to think our way through it, the power of our intelligence, our creative energy, to think our way through it. You know, it's like, because I'm interested, because you know, we have what we call the five senses, you know, but I, I think there's, they're double that, <laughs> all right, because I think for every, you know, the, the human part is the visible, visible, and the being is the invisible, visible. And I think each part has its own way of sense, so to speak. But then, so I go with that, but that sixth sense. See, I think the sixth sense is common sense. Yeah. I think it's common sense, and I think we all have it in common. Yeah. Because that's our power, the common sense. It's just up to us to use it, to practice, to start doing it. You know what I mean? And it's a decision we make. Because really, you know, like, don't make emotional decisions. I mean, if you want to have an emotional fit, go ahead and have it, but then make the decisions later. <laughs> don't make emotional decisions. Make clear, thought-out decisions. 
clear, thought out decisions. It's like learning how to use our thinking process. You know, whatever it is, every person in this room has something that they made a decision they wanted to learn how to do. And then when they made the decision about wanting to learn how, learning how to do what they wanted to do, then they focused their thinking process on learning how to do it. So, see, we do it already. I'm just saying we make the decision that, we want to, that we're going to use our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we can. And if it doesn't make sense, don't try to make it make sense. If something doesn't make sense to you, don't try to make it make sense. And that's the other thing, you know, I'm going to wander out of here in a minute because the coherence is fading. <laughs> right? uh, uh, but, and, and let yourself, all right? Let yourself think clearly and coherently. Let yourself see yourself in a clean way, the way the Creator made us to be as human beings. Allow it. Let yourself. Don't try to make yourself do something. Because it's a basic contradiction. If somebody tries to make me do something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it just doesn't really fly very well. Even when I try to make me do something, that's how. <laughs> Does that make sense? See? But if somebody lets me do something, see, that's a whole other reality. So if I let myself do, right, then I have it's a whole different attitude. It's like helping the good guys versus fighting the bad guys. It's how we choose to perceive. So I'm going to close with a, wait, I want to find that poem. It, it's called, well, there's, all right, this is called uh, Into Invisible. And, and I'm, I appreciate any sense I made to you. And if I didn't make sense to you, I don't want to hear about it. Because <laughs> that don't make sense to me, right? I mean, think about it. It makes sense. It don't make sense to you. It don't make sense. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> and, see, <laughs> see I'm, I'm a, doing what I do, you know, I, I'm kind of like a live month to month kind of reality. Or, you know, sometimes two months to two months. <laughs> and, and like I told you, I'm crazy, you know. So, I can't afford therapy, so you're it. <laughs> I feel a lot better now. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with us. You know, if nothing else, take that out of here. Nothing wrong with us. All right? It's just, it was all a lie. All a lie. He's an old man now. In worlds he accumulated long left behinds when only today was real, and yesterday and tomorrow were always on their own. He did the things he should and the things he shouldn't, weaving regrets and glories into invisible ribbons and scars. When there was no place else to go, he went further into his mind, into places where memories begin and imaginations are still wide open. All those worst that could happen kept inviting him back for more, with invitations dressed up in allure, until came a time he finally caught on. When the best that could happen kept coming back not to be denied, showing him there are ways through into the reality of rhythms and flows, comes a time too slow down the hurry. Life lives in the moment to moment. How we breathe is how we balance. Thank you.
unlearn, relearn.